Southern California, good afternoon and welcome to another edition of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. We have plenty to talk about, such as UCLA men's hoops. Unfortunately, their dream season came to an end off of a heartbreaker heave against top-seeded Gonzaga. What went wrong, and how did UCLA hang tough with the number one team in the tournament? Also, the Clippers have been red hot. Could the Clippers actually make noise in the NBA playoffs? Mm, we'll see. And the Lakers are still trying to keep themselves in the top eight or in the top six to automatically qualify for the playoffs without having to play that play-in game. But they still have a lot of injuries going on. When will LeBron, AD, and all the others come back? Also, the Angels, they are off to a surprisingly good start. They won their opening series against the White Sox. They split with the Astros, and they won their first game of their current series against the Toronto Blue Jays. Can the Angels keep it up? I hope so. And then the Dodgers are still the Dodgers. They're still tearing teams apart. They get their championship rings today. And then the Padres, they're doing good as well, but the main concern could be Fernando Tatis Jr. Also, it is 90s week here at IE Sports Radio. I'll be going over the past finalists and champions from Southern California, whether it's college sports or professional sports. Who are those teams? You'll have to find out all that and more on the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. This is Taron Rodriguez bringing you another edition of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. And welcome one, welcome all to another edition of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. Thank you for joining me on this beautiful Friday afternoon. It is greatly, greatly appreciated. Sorry about the little delayed start time, considering I did have a call that came that I was that I had to pick up and whatnot. So there's that right there, but it's all good. And I know it's another weird flex time for the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. But because ev I'm super busy with everything, I gotta flex it to to 1 p.m. I was gonna flex it to 4 p.m., but I don't think that's gonna work out with my schedule. So this week is 1 p.m. Pacific time. Next week, I'm not sure, but who knows? Who knows if it'll be uh, at its if it'll be on Thursday or if it'll be on Friday. All that matters is that we've got a show this week. So without any further delay, let's get on into the Southern California sports that's been happening. But first, we have some sponsors to go over, such as two sponsors. The first sponsor is Legacy Financial. Legacy Financial is here to help you no matter what your financial status is all about. Last year was a tough year. But staying positive, keeping your faith, and continuing to work hard is the goal. If you're in a financial struggle at the moment, you're doing well and you want to get to the next level, or you're looking for a new opportunity to work for yourself part-time and earn more money, give AO a call at 510-928-2104. That number again is 510-928-2104 to book your appointment today. Io and her husband, Andrew, are just two people on a mission to help families build a legacy. You can follow them on Twitter at Legacy underscore Uncut. And you can follow them on Twitter or follow them on Instagram at Sims underscore Uncut. And iSports Radio actually just got themselves a new sponsor. And it's actually some it's actually a new sponsor that's close to Southern California, which is really cool. 
iSports Radio's newest sponsor is SoCal Warriors, or Southern California Warriors. The Southern California Warriors are a semi-pro football organization located in Marietta, California. And you actually, this is actually a pay-to-play team, and you don't get paid, but it is thought of as pretty much a full-time job, and it pretty much uh, gives you the the uh, possibility of playing with the team as well as taking care of your family and going to school and training to stay in shape and perform on Saturdays during the season. So, so there's that right there. So thank you to Legacy Financial and our new sponsor, Southern California Warriors, the semi-pro team in Southern California, for being the official sponsors of IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. So now, without any further delay, let's get on in to the Southern California action. So last week, we had UCLA's men's basketball team advancing to the Final Four. From the first four all the way to the Final Four, it was quite the beautiful sight for for the Bruins, especially if you're a UCLA fan. Like, I'm not a UCLA fan, but I was so happy to see the Bruins just continuing their run. Like, a part of me was hoping that they would actually win it all. Like, it would have been so cool if that were the case. Unfortunately, they ran it to a tough Gonzaga team. They were actually holding their own early on, but but uh, Gonzaga was uh, doing everything it can to, like, keep UCLA away from taking the lead. The game actually went to overtime, which is quite surprising. And UCLA just... I gotta give credit to UCLA. They matched Gonzaga tit for tat. And it was much better than the first Final Four matchup between Baylor and Houston. Like, that one was very one-sided, if you ask me. But UCLA actually was down five in overtime. And then I forget who made the three, but I think it was like... Jaime Jaquez made a three, or was it Johnny Juzang? Either way, what both those t- players were just straight up balling out for for UCLA. And then Johnny Juzang made a putback layout after he missed his jump shot. But unfortunately, and it, there was like 3.6 seconds left on the clock, but unfortunately that was enough time for Gonzaga as they got the ball to Jalen Suggs as he managed to pretty much bank in a near half quarter. Like, it was pretty deep. I think it was like a 40-footer, and it was just heartbreak. I'm like, are you kidding me? And honestly, that's the worst way to lose if you're a team, especially in the Final Four. Like, you lost off of a bank shot heave from way downtown. And that's actually the second time UCLA has been heartbroken through a game-winning three-pointer. Because UCLA actually lost to USC earlier in the season, courtesy of Tajidi. But Jalen Suggs... Well, Jalen Suggs is like a baller. Like, Gonzaga has a lot of stud players. Unfortunately, their must their uh, Bulldogs were pretty much just... Had a little bit more bite than the Bruins did. But it doesn't take away from the amazing season that UCLA had. Like, the Bruins just did everything possible to, like, get all the way to the... NCAA championship and to the Final Four. Like, keep in mind, this UCLA team almost lost to Michigan State in the play-in games, or the first four games, which, it's quite astounding. Like, to, to go over UCLA's run through the NCAA tournament, they beat Michigan State in the first four, and then they beat BYU in the round of 64, and then they beat Albaline Christian in the round of 32, then they beat Alabama in the Sweet 16. Then they beat Michigan in the Elite 8. And then, unfortunately, UCLA just kind of ran out of gas when they played that really tough Gonzaga team. However, because UCLA had such an amazing game, or an amazing season, Mick Cronin actually got a two-year extension. So now his contract goes from... All the way to 2027, which is absolutely amazing, and he deserves it. Like, it's absolutely amazing that UCLA went from. The, like, keep in mind that UCLA was the last four teams in. Like, they were this close to missing the playoffs. 
or not the playoffs, the NCAA tournament, the postseason. That's what I'm trying to say. So it's a good thing UCLA was able to win some of its games that mattered. Like they had a lot of some close wins, though. I think they had a close win against Washington. They had a close win against Arizona State. Like some of their wins were vi- were nail biters. So. So I will give credit to UCLA, even as a USC fan. I just wish it would have... If, if they had been in the NCAA championship, I would have liked to see Baylor versus UCLA. The Battle of the Bears. Bruins versus Bears. Um, to that end, in terms of NCAA men's basketball, Gonzaga actually got hammered in the national championship game by Baylor. Baylor straight up whooped them. I forgot what the... Final score was, but Gonzaga never led. That's all you need to know. Gonzaga never led, and that was that for them. They basically, Gonzaga basically had no shot. Like, they fell behind 9 nothing. That was it. 86-70 to was the final score between Baylor and Gonzaga. It was the battle of number one seeds, and Baylor actually handed Gonzaga their first loss of the season. <laughs> so, unfortunately, unfortunately, we still will not get to see another NCAA men's basketball team go undefeated and win the national championship. This is just a friendly reminder, and I tweeted out this on my personal account, that no matter what level it is, no matter what sport it is, it's always tough to go undefeated and win a championship in the same season. It really is. Like, sometimes you'd rather lose your first game of the season or you'd rather lose to a team that you that is nowhere near as good as you instead of just losing on the big stage. So, there's... There's that, in my opinion. And honestly, I give Gonzaga all the credit in the world, but they just got exposed. And you got to give credit to Baylor. Like, Baylor and Gonzaga were the number one and number two team in the nation for the most part of the season. Even when Baylor had their COVID shut down, and even when Baylor lost to certain teams, I think they lost to Oklahoma State. I'm not sure who they lost to, but... Because I don't cover Baylor. I This is the SoCal Supreme Sports Show, not the Texas Supreme Sports Show, if you know what I mean. But the fact that Baylor was able to pull off that win over Gonzaga is quite remarkable. And I think it, it just goes to show you that this is a testament to to Baylor's toughness and resiliency. Yeah, they did lose to Oklahoma State in the semifinals of the Big Ten Tournament. And then they lost to Kansas in February, which was their first loss of the season. So there's that right there. So in closing for the NCAA men's basketball season regarding Southern California, it was a fun year on the men's and women's side. Cal Baptist completed an an undefeated run through the regular season. It would have been great to see them. Or I'm sorry, not Cal Baptist. California Baptist, or CBU, completed an undefeated undefeated run through the regular season and then they and then they uh unfortunately they lost in the WNIT but it doesn't take away the amazing season the Lady Lancers had and yes I will say the Lady Lancers I don't care if people people call me out for calling someone the Lady Lancers or whatnot like if they want to call me out you could you could sit, tell it to my face like you don't need to like quote tweet me and it, it, cuz you know where i be <laughs> um and on the men's side like the women's side i think was kind of underwhelming when it came to like the NCAA tournament partially because there was only one team that made the one team from southern california that made the NCAA tournament and that was UCLA and they wound up losing in the round of 32 to Texas which again i didn't, i didn't think they would lose that early i thought UCLA was at least going to at least maybe the Sweet 16 or the Elite 8, but that was not the case. Regardless, it was still a phenomenal season for UCLA on the women's side. And then, like I said, CBU had an outstanding season. I know they still have one more year of that transition period, but I hope they could just they have the same success as last year. It's going to be... Or same success as this year. It's going to be tough to replicate that, though. But you never know. And then on the men's side of things... 
I was really impressed with how UCLA and USC performed in the tournament. I thought USC was going to go no further than the Sweet 16. But they really went above and beyond. Especially when they beat Kansas. Whew, they put a spanking on them. And then they beat Oregon the second time. And I thought they, that was going to be a tighter matchup than it needed to be. But UCLA, or not UCLA, USC made everything work. And they really let Oregon have it. Unfortunately, USC just fell short. And when I mean fell short, they fell really short in the Elite Eight matchup against Gonzaga. And I would have liked to see USC and UCLA in the Final Four facing one another. It would have been awesome, but it, that wasn't the case. UCLA, like I, I pretty much talked about, just saying that they went four, from first four in, or last four in, to the first four matchup, all the way to the Final Four. It is remarkable. And to take Gonzaga all the way to overtime and almost beat them is absolutely astounding. If they don't go up, get off to that horrid start in overtime, I think the Bruins actually win that game. So, quite impressed with how the UCLA and USC men's basketball season ended, even though it would have been great to see one if one team in the championship game, but it is what it is. And then UC Santa Barbara was also impressive this year. They had quite the phenomenal season. I know they got bounced in the first round to Creighton, but Creighton's such a great team year in and year out. I, I know Creighton doesn't have the championship pedigree as, like, Gonzaga does. Well, no, no Gonzaga doesn't even have a championship, but Creighton doesn't have, like, the championship pedigree like North Carolina or Duke, but Creighton always has a great team in the Big East. So I give credit to... UC Santa Barbara on a phenomenal season. And then San Diego State also had a great season. They, It looked as if their season wasn't going to be too good after they lost twice to Utah. I think it was Utah State. And then they also blew that 27-point lead to Colorado State. But then you, and then San Diego State really turned it around. So I give them credit. Unfortunately, they just ran to the buzzsaw that was Syracuse, which... I think we could all agree that ACC teams are teams that that should not ever, 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 ever be underestimated. No matter who you are. Like, even Miami could probably beat any team. And then the last shout-out i got to give for the NCAA men's basketball season is Pepperdine. Now, I know Pepperdine didn't even make the NCAA tournament, but they won the college invitational tournament or the College Basketball Invitational. It, it was the CBI, and the fact that they won some sort of postseason championship is quite impressive. I know it's not as glamorous as winning the NCAA championship, but you, but Pepperdine was such a was such an under-the-radar team. They took BYU to overtime, and I think if Pep beats BYU, I don't even think... I think BYU is a last four team in and not UCLA. Heck, maybe even Pepperdine might have been a last four team in, but I still give credit to Pepperdine on the amazing season they had. And again, I'm happy they had some postseason success. I'm happy they were able to win their their little matchup in the in the uh, not the NIT, but the uh, but the CBI. But it is what it is. I'm I'm I. I, to me, am satisfied, and I can't wait for next season. And hopefully UCLA and USC do, do have success, especially USC. It's going to be tough to replicate their team from this year, though. Like, USC will will lose Tajidi. He will not take the extra year of eligibility, and he will pursue the NBA draft, which I didn't even think that was possible. I But... Well, with all these players that that are flying in and out of the transfer portal, um, it's going to be quite fascinating to see what happens. Noah Bauman, on that note, Noah Bauman do, did enter the transfer portal for from USC. So I wish Noah Bauman the best. And then it all depends on what, on who stays and who goes from UCLA. Like the from the Pac-12, there was quite a bit of players in the transfer portal, primarily from Colorado and. Oregon State, two teams that actually had a pretty decent NCAA tournament run. So there's that. But I will also say this: like it all depends on 
the signing class of USC and UCLA and all those other SoCal schools. UCLA signing class looks good as I think his name is Peyton Watson from Long Beach Poly is coming to UCLA. That guy is a beast. He is a man, a man above men. Like you, you, you can't say enough good about him. And the fact that he chose UCLA is quite astounding. Like USC is going to really need to bring in a good class. And you know, I don't know what's going to happen with Evan Mobley. Most people are saying that he's going to go to the NBA draft. And that does make sense. Like I can see Evan Mobley as a going to the NBA draft or declaring for the NBA draft. But I'll also say this, like, I hope he stays one more year because I don't think he's fully ready. I think he's he can do well in the NBA, but I think he needs to put on more muscle and and whatnot. And I don't think another year with his dad Eric Mobley and Andy Enfield wouldn't hurt him. Like, ju- like, and then he'll also get another year with Isaiah Mobley. So we'll see. We'll see how it goes for Evan Mobley. And then the Big West Conference, I'm not overly hyped on. and I have been seeing a few transfers in and out. I did see that Long Beach State's uh, Chance Hunter uh, tra- transferred from Long Beach State to CBU, and I wish him the best. I think Long Beach State also got another transfer as well. I think he came from Texas A&M and whatnot. Either way, I think... Next season is going to be a fun season when it comes to NCAA men's and women's basketball in Southern California. So there's that. And now we close the book on that, and we won't be going back until I see some news. And my question is this. What will happen with Andy Enfield? Will he be getting an extension considering USC went all the way to the Elite Eight? And that's actually the first time since 2001 that USC went to the Elite Eight. So... We'll see. But that's going to do it for the NCAA men's and women's portion of the show. I also got to give a shout-out to Stanford, who won the Stanford Women's Basketball for winning the NCAA Women's Basketball Championship over Pac-12 foe Arizona. I know Stanford is Northern California, but I got to tip my hat to them because Stanford continues its winning streak of winning an NCAA championship. I don't know the last time they didn't win an NCAA championship in a year. But considering this is a pandemic year, I gotta give them credit. I gotta give them credit. All right, now let's jump to the let's jump to the NBA. So, Lakers and Clippers are the tale of two different teams. The Clippers have actually been on a hot streak. Remember when I said last week they they had a tough four game stretch, losing to Denver. They lost to Denver last Thursday, which that was no April Fool's joke. But then on Sunday, the Clippers stomped on the Lakers 104-86, to which, again, everyone is making a huge deal about the Lakers losing to the Clippers, even though the Lakers did not have Andre Drummond, they didn't have Wesley Matthews, they didn't have LeBron, and they didn't have AD, and it's really, 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 really starting to bug me. But then the Clippers followed that up, beating the Trailblazers 133-116. to And then last night, the Clippers beat the Suns 113-103. to So... The Clippers face the Rockets tonight, and I could see the Clippers winning that one. The Rockets have been an atrocity this year. Sunday, the Clippers play the Pistons at Staples Center. And then on Tuesday, the Clippers travel to Indiana to face the Pacers. I want to say Miles Turner is injured, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. Miles Turner is injured. Yeah, Miles Turner is day-to-day. He is out for Friday's game, so there's that right there. Definitely check out more Indiana action on High Octane Entertainment. That goes on 10 a.m. Pacific Time, 7 a.m. or I'm sorry, 10 a.m. Eastern Time, 7 a.m. Pacific Time, and that's hosted by Justin Lar. Definitely do check out High Octane Entertainment. Justin Lar does a great job with his show, and I definitely think you all should tune in. So. Back to the Clippers. Next Wednesday, the Clippers face the Pistons at the Palace of Auburn Hills. And then next Friday, the Clippers are also on the road against Philadelphia. And then the following Sunday, 
the Clippers are home against the Timberwolves. So there's that. But overall, the Clippers have been looking really good. They are the number three seeds so far, like, but they're closing that gap behind Phoenix. They're only two games back of the Suns, which Phoenix has also been a tremendous surprise, but as well as Utah. But I think that the Western Conference is up for grabs. Like anyone can win that, can win the Western Conference, and anyone being any of the uh, West Coast teams. Um, the only team I don't really see winning would probably be Memphis. Like eight, like Mem- between Memphis and San Antonio, I don't see them winning the the NBA championship. Golden State, if they had Clay, I think they'd be a lot better than than twenty four and twenty seven and number ten in the Western Conference. But I could also see Golden State being a possible dark horse. But if they have to face the Jazz in the first round then Utah is going to really sock it to them. Dallas could also be an interesting team to consider as a possible dark horse to win the NBA championship. But can they win a seven-game series against the Phoenix Suns? Like, it all depends on Luka Doncic and Kristaps Porzingis and all those other players and whatnot. So, And then Portland is also good. Portland... Portland is the number six seed, and Portland would actually be the Clippers' first-round opponent. Now, I know Portland isn't the most consistent team, but with Damian Lillard and whatnot, they could be a tricky matchup for any three seed. Like, everyone was praising them last year against the Lakers, and they were thinking, oh, the Trailblazers are actually going to knock off the, the Lakers and whatnot. I still want to see the Trailblazers actually do something in the postseason. And they look good on paper, but my only qualm with them is this. Can they do something and get out of the first round? Like, that's my little thing. That's my spiel for them. And like I said, they have Damian Lillard. They have Carmelo Anthony. They have C.J. McCollum and Nurkic and whatnot. But I will also say this, Portland, that while they are a good team, they don't really like, they underperform in the postseason. Like, I, I thought at least they were going to take the Lakers to six, but after they lost Damian Lillard, that was pretty much that. So, so we'll see how Portland Clippers stacks up, and you never know with the Clippers. They could move up, they could move down, it all depends. But that's enough for the Clippers right now. Now let's go to the Lakers. So the poor Lakers are still battered and bruised. Um, I will give them this, however, their fir- their first four games of their of their seven game road trip actually looked pretty pretty promising. Like the Lakers are two and two on their seven game road trip. Lakers stomped on the Kings last Friday, winning one fifteen to ninety four. That was quite impressive because they didn't have. LeBron, AD, Andre Drummond, and I don't think they had uh, Wesley Matthews. I'm not sure about that, but I will also say this. Uh, Kyle Kuzma really stepped up. Like He had 30 points, and also they got contributions from Je- Dennis Schroeder, KCP, Markeith Morris, and Taylor Horton Tucker, which, again, it's quite astounding. And Wesley Matthews only played five minutes. I'm pretty sure he got hurt in that Kings game. So, good stuff for the Lakers against the Kings. Unfortunately, they met their match against the Clippers, but that was a lost cause because they would have needed to have everyone intact for them to have a chance. But the Lakers also bounced back and won their game against the Toronto Raptors this past Tuesday, winning 110-101. to Lakers jumped out to a big lead, and then they were able to hold on despite what Toronto brought to the table. Lakers were surprisingly led by Taylor Horton Tucker, who had 17 points, which I didn't think that would be their leading scorer, but it is what it is. He d- he did that off the bench, mind you. Like The Lakers scoring was pretty balanced. They got 15 points from Markeith Morris. They got 13 points apiece from Marc Gasol, and Alex Caruso, and KCP. 12 points from Dennis Schroeder, and then 10 points from Devontae Cook, I I don't know what who this guy is like, this Devonte Cook guy. But 
I guess he's on the Lakers now. I didn't even know he was on the Lakers. But it is what it is. And then they got nine points from Wesley Matthews, who was limited in minutes. Um, unfortunately for the Lakers, they lost last night to the Miami Heat, losing 110-104. But to all you Heat fans out there, I'm just going to say this. I don't care if y'all won. Like, congratulations on your revenge match. Call us when we have AD, when we have LeBron, when we have... When our team is fully healthy, we can take down... We can take down the Heat. Like, that win means squat diddly for the Lakers. Or that, that, that loss means squat diddly for the Lakers. Because even though the Lakers have slipped down to five, I can still see them getting into the postseason. Like, they're still being competitive in their games, and they don't have too many back-to-backs. Like, I know that Heat actually need that win. Like, the Heat are just tr- trying to, like, cling in the ever-so-shoddy Eastern Conference, where four, four through three, through 10 is like wide open like from the charlotte hornets all the way down to the chicago bulls like anyone can maybe make the postseason and it's quite astounding honestly it's astounding how bad the eastern conference is so there's that right there like it's compared to the west it's it mean it's pretty shoddy if you ask me like even the knicks have a chance to make the postseason what a world we live in Never would have guessed. So, anyway, for the Los Angeles Lakers, they return to action on Saturday at Brooklyn against the Nets. And then on Monday, they have a matchup against the New York Knicks. And then on Tuesday, even though I said they don't have a whole lot of back-to-backs, they still have a back-to-back against the Charlotte Hornets. So that's going to conclude their three-game road trip the Lakers are so far two and two which isn't bad I don't, like two and two is pretty decent I know the Kings aren't that great and the Raptors have been pretty shoddy but they held they held their own for the most part against the Heat like they were in it for the most part until the Heat swung the momentum in the fourth quarter which really was not convenient for them and then the Clippers were just a lot it was just a lost cause against the Clippers like um, also, it didn't help that the Lakers did not have Taylor Horton Tucker against the the Miami Heat. He got suspended because he got in an altercation with I forget his first name, but Obino, Obunomi, I think his name is. Yeah, and then Mark M- Montrose Hero also got ejected as well. He he didn't get suspended, but. He had to pay a fine as well. So, Lakers were very shorthanded against the Heat. Like, no, it's all there. It's already bad enough they didn't have LeBron and AD, but with no, and they they didn't have Kyle Kuzma as well. So, Lakers have just been riding the injury bus, and the injury bug has been feasting on them. Um, next Thursday, the Lakers return home where they'll unveil championship banner number 17 against the Boston Celtics. And then next Saturday, the Lakers also have a matchup against the Utah Jazz, which that's going to be pretty tough. They have back-to-back matches against Utah. Oh, gosh. If the Lakers can salvage one win against the Jazz, that would be quite astounding. But it's their schedule gets really tough. Like, even the Hornets look good. Like, the Hornets and the Knicks, they're going to want to boost up they're going to want wins. And then, of course, the Lakers picked the Celtics to unveil their championship banner. And then they're also allowing... And then something good for the Lakers and Clippers is that they're allowing fans into their stadium. Like, California is actually starting to get out of the purple tier, which is great because I think most of California is like in like orange tier or red tier. Mostly red and orange. Like, I think there's only two counties that's still in purple tier. But California is doing their part to, like, slow the spread. And everyone is getting vaccinated. So, which I hope I can as well. So, it's a beautiful thing when it comes to seeing things starting to reopen up in Southern California. Or in California in general. So, we just gotta do our part, people. Please just mask up, and even if you get the vaccination, you're not invincible. You're not, you're you're not invincible when it comes to to catching the virus and whatnot. So there's that right there. So 
But in closing on the Lakers, as long as the Lakers have some consistent wins, like as long as they're still in like the echelon of the of the five six spot, I think they'll be fine. Like if they somehow drop to the seven seven spot, then I kind of would be worried considering that they'd have to play that play in game. Though Anthony Davis might be on the men to come back, but Frank Vogel did say that. Anthony Davis is still a little ways to go in terms of returning. They did get Andre Drummond back, which he, I think he might be on minutes restriction, but Drummond is back playing for the Lakers after he had a toe contusion. And then the Lakers also did sign Ben McLemore, which I'm happy they did. I mean, I, I kind of think he's a good player. Like, like he does shoot well from the perimeter, but I'll also make note that I don't know how long he's played and I don't know what his uh, career career bests are, but I think he adds depth to the Lakers. Like, I think it's it's a good thing. Like, looking at Ben McLemore, uh, yeah, he is a Kansas boy, and... And, uh, yeah, he was on the, the Rockets last I checked. So he got out of Houston, and he won it on the Lakers, so... Good for Ben. <laughs> oh, poor Houston. They're having such a train wreck here, but this isn't Houston sports. This is so so Cal sports. All right, so that's going to do it for the Lakers and Clippers talk and talk of the NBA. Again, I really want the Lakers. Uh, the Lakers should be fine going into the postseason. Once they get LeBron and AD back and everyone else that's hurt back, I think the Lakers will be the team that no one still wants to see in the postseason. It all depends on if there's going to be home court advantage when it comes to like the postseason or if they're just going to play in the bubble again. Like If the Lakers play in the bubble again, I still like their chances. If the Lakers... Uh, but then again, I also like the Lakers playing on the road. The Lakers have been a solid road team, surprisingly, and I think that they can still win on the road regardless of where it's going to be at. Like, I think the Lakers are just that good. Like, you look at the stand, like, looking at the Lakers standings, Lakers are 16 and 11 at home and then 16 and 9 away. So, okay, maybe their their records aren't ultimately that too far off in terms of road versus away, but Lakers have had some good road wins. Like, their win against the Celtics was pretty good. So, either way, I'm still confident in the Lakers. The Clippers. I think they can at least get out of the first round, but okay, I, but until they get out of the second round, I don't want people to set. I don't want anyone to be making plans of Clippers versus Nets in the finals. Like until the Clippers get out of the first round or get out of the second round, I don't want to hear anyone's talk of Clippers versus Nets or Clippers are going to celebrate their first NBA championship. No, no. As far as I'm concerned, the Clippers are the biggest Peyton Manning of the NBA. I talk about how teams like the Nets, the Rockets, well, back when they were good, the Jazz, the all those teams that seem to fall short in the second round, those teams are basically the Peyton Manning of the NBA playoffs. But I think the Clippers are the biggest Peyton Manning other than, and we're not talking about championship Manning, where he won Super Bowl 50 and he won the uh, Super Bowl against the Chicago, the Chicago Bears. We're talking about yearly bad Peyton Manning in the postseason. Just saying, y'all. I'm sorry if I'm offending all the Peyton Manning fans out there, but it is what it is. All right, but that's enough talk for the NBA. Let's jump to a little NHL talk, and then we'll take ourselves a quick little breaky break. If I could find the NHL. So, in terms of the NHL standings. So, just when we all thought the Kings couldn't get worse, they got worse. So, the Kings are the Kings and the Ducks are basically at the bottom of the barrel when it comes to the West. They... Kings have 36 points. They are they have 15 wins, 17 losses, and six overtime losses. While the Ducks have 
31 points and have 12 wins, 21 losses, and 7 overtime losses. It's just been an epitome of pain for both teams. <laughs> and the Kings are actually doing pretty good until until recently now, which they are now falling apart and it sucks. This past Wednesday, but this past Wednesday they did beat the Arizona Coyotes, but they lost last Monday to the Coyotes 5 to 2. On Wednesday they beat the Coyotes 4 to 3. Last Saturday the Kings lost to the Sharks 3 to 2 and then last Friday the Kings lost to the Sharks 3 nothing. Absolute pain right there. But at least the Kings beat the Golden Knights 2 weeks ago. They salvaged a split in that in that uh two game stretch. So looking at the schedule going forward, the Kings face the San Jose Sharks tonight. And then they face the San Jose Sharks tomorrow. Both games are going to be in San Jose. And then on Monday and Wednesday, the Kings face the Golden Knights of Vegas at Staples Center. And then next Friday and Sunday, they play the Kings play the Colorado Avalanche. And then I guess it's worth noting that on Tuesday, April 20th, oh my god, 420, the Kings and the Ducks face one another. It's basically going to be the most lit last place match ever. And it wouldn't surprise me if the Ducks actually won that one. Speaking of the Ducks, that is perfect segue to go into everyone's least least successful team in Southern California. And I know there's only two teams, but and I know the Ducks have recently made the playoffs sooner than the Kings, but the Kings have two Stanley Cups. If that truly means anything, I know the Ducks won their the Stanley Cups faster than the Kings did, but to me, I I prefer quantity over over like being early, in my opinion. Anyway, so the Ducks beat the Sharks five to one on Tuesday, which was a surprise. Psych. No, the the Sharks are just as bad. Like California, in terms of hockey, is so shoddy. Like you look at the Sharks, Kings, and Ducks. The Ducks are the bottom of the barrel of the West. The Kings are the second to worst team in the West. And then the Sharks are right ahead of the Kings in terms of worst team in the West. On Sunday, the Ducks lost to the Coyotes 3-2. to two. And then last Friday, the Ducks lost to the Coyotes 4-2. to two. And then last Monday, they lost to the Avalanche 5-2. to two. And then the Ducks also beat the Blues on March 28th, 3 to 2, which I guess is cool, but not really. So going looking ahead to the Ducks' schedule, the Ducks play the Colorado Avalanche tonight and they also play the Avalanche on Sunday. Both games are going to be held at the Honda Center, and then on Monday and Wednesday, the Ducks play at San Jose against the Sharks. And that's this upcoming Monday and Wednesday, and then next Friday and next Sunday, the Ducks play the Golden Knights back at the Honda Center. So there's that right there. And then, like I said, Tuesday, the Kings and the Ducks will face each other on Mar- on April 20th at 7 p.m. at Staples Center. So, so there's that in terms of the Ducks versus Ducks and the Kings. Both teams are looking like they're not going to be heading to the postseason this year, which is really sad. Because the top four teams in each div- in each division, yeah, top four teams in each division make the postseason. I will say this about the Ducks: at least they're not the Buffalo Sabers. Like, no offense to any Sabers fans out there, but the Sabers are putrid. Even the Red Wings are have a better record than the Buffalo, the Buffalo Sabers. So, hey, to all Buffalo fans, at least you got the Bills. That's all I gotta tell you. <laughs> uh, but that's gonna do it for the hockey talk between the Ducks and the Kings. Uh, at least I at least want to see the Kings make the postseason. Like the Kings are seven points out of the final playoff spot, as they're trailing San Jose and St. Louis, as well as the Coyotes. The Coyotes hold the final spot, and then. The third, the uh, top three spots of the Western West Western Division 
is basically occupied by Colorado, Vegas, and Minnesota, who have 56, 52, and 50 points, respectively. I highly doubt the Kings catch up to those teams, but you never know. Like, the Kings at least just need to make the postseason. That's all I asked for. Like, this was supposed to be a pretty special team. Like, I thought this was going to be at least the season where the Ducks or the Kings make the postseason, but it's turning out to be another bust, which really sucks. Like, the... Like, the Ducks are basically treading toward the bottom of the barrel. Like, they have the third... In terms of points, they have the third lowest points. Like, Buffalo has 24 points, Ottawa has 30 points, and then the Ducks have 31. So, it's been tough, but you just gotta move forward. Look look ahead to the future. Maybe make a splash in, in a free agency. Just build on the draft and whatnot. So, there's that. But that is enough for Hockey Talk right there. And we're actually going to take ourselves a quick little commercial break. When we come back, we'll have some talk about the MLB and what's been happening with the Angels, Padres, and Dodgers. And it's 90s week, so we'll be going over all of the champions regarding the the Southern California teams in the 90s, whether it's college sports or whether it's pro sports. So you're listening to the SoCal Supreme Sports Show here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Hey, sports fans. Do you like wine? Well, we've got the show for you. This is Let's Wine About Sports, a show where we talk about wine and sports simultaneously. From the classic Cabernet Sauvignon all the way down to the grapes that you've never even heard of before. Oh, yeah, we cover it all. And we'll talk about a little bit of sports as well. Football, hockey, collegiate, women's sports, it doesn't matter. We're going to talk about it all, and we're going to whine about it all. So join me Monday at 8 p.m. on IU Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. If you're someone who wakes up each morning with list of sporting events to go along with your to-do list for the day, then you just might be a diehard. The world of sports is as vast as the ocean is deep, including the major leagues, the minor leagues, the colleagues, and everything in between. This is me, your brother, Larry B. of IE Sports Radio, welcoming you to join me every Monday evening at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern on The Defining Moment, a show that focuses on what really matters in the sports world, sports themselves, and nothing outside of them. Once again, tune in for The Defining Moment with me, your boy Larry B. every Monday evening at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern on IE Sports Radio, right here on Spreaker.com. We'll see you there. College football, and do you want to hear a college football show dedicated to all this college football, including junior college and the Triple CAA and the NJCAA, the NAIA, and the NCAA, including Division Three, Division Two, II, Division One AA in the FCS, and Division One Single A in the FBS? Well, then look no further. 
join myself, Larry B, and my colleagues, Mr. H-Town Blake, Blake Henley, and Mr. Christian Espinoza, each week during the college football season for the latest in college football on Free and Out College Edition, right here on IE Sports Radio, your directory for all that is sports. And we are back with the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. You can check out all of our amazing shows on many different platforms, such as such as Spreaker, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn, YouTube, you name it. And you can check out all of our amazing shows, such as Let's Wind About Sports with Mike Pat, which goes on every Sunday at 6 p.m. Pacific Time, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. And then you could check out Larry B's several different shows, such as Defining Moment, which hopefully we get that back soon, and Three and Out, which never really got its season finale, but it is what it is. And all those the other shows that he hosts, like I don't, like he, tonight he's supposed to actually host. Uh, sounds like Grimes with Sports Couples Perspective with with himself and his girlfriend Cecilia. And we'll see if that's going to be going on this week. So there's that. But on that note, it is time to get back into the Southern California sports action. We are here for segment two. We are back for segment two of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. And this week has been is 90s theme when it comes to all of I Sports Radio certain shows. So just like what I did with the with set point, I'll be going over the champions. Regarding Southern California, the only negative thing about the champions in Southern California is that in terms of pro sports, there weren't too many champions. As a matter of fact, I don't think there was one champion when it, from Southern California in terms of pro sports. Like, the Chargers made the the uh, Super Bowl in 95, which was their only Super Bowl appearance. Didn't work out for them. And then the Rams, who were the then St. Louis Rams, won their Super Bowl in 19. 19- or in 2000, and that they were still St. Louis, unfortunately. And in terms of like teams, pro teams from Southern California that made the finals or the championship game, we had the Lakers making the championship game back in 1991. Unfortunately, they lost to the Chicago Bulls, which had Michael Jordan. And then also the San Diego Padres made the World Series back in 1998, but unfortunately they lost to the New York Yankees in a sweep, which is a bummer, but hopefully the Padres have what it takes to win it. Hopefully in the near future. They have for, they have the tools. They have Fernando Tatis Jr. They have Blake Snell as pitcher, Manny Machado. The list goes on and on. So... In terms of college sports, however, college sports is a definitely different story, as there are lots of past champions in Southern California college sports. We'll start with NCAA baseball. So, going all the way back to 1992, we had Pepperdine winning the NCAA World Series as Andy Lopez guided Pepperdine to a 48-11-1 season as they beat Cal State Fullerton 3-2 in the in the championship game and Cal State Fullerton was the runner up. So good stuff for the Titans. This that basically was what started the the uh, Titans' is uh, dynasty in terms of baseball. And Cal State Fullerton always has a great baseball team see year in and year out. Speaking of Cal State Fullerton, they actually won the World Series back in 1995 as Augie Garrido was the winning skipper for the Titans. Fullerton went 57 and 9 as they beat as they beat USC 11 to 5 in the championship game and all the all the championship matchups were held in Omaha. So for those wondering where all these championship matchups were held, oh, it was held in Omaha, aka Peyton Manning's favorite 
City. <laughs> anyway, but Cal State Fullerton won the championship back in 95, thanks to Augie Garrido as their head skipper. USC actually got to win the the World College World Series championship as they won in 1998. Mike Gillespie, the late Mike Gillespie, led USC to a 49 and 17 record as the Trojans knocked off Arizona State 21 in the 21 to 14 in the match clinching series and that looks like a football score if you ask me. I looked at that I'm like 21 to 14. Wow. And that was actually the most home runs scored in that decade in terms of one, in terms of the match clinching game. So good job to USC and that's pretty much all of the base the Southern California baseball teams that won the College World Series. In terms of NCAA men's soccer, UCLA started off the 1990s by winning the by winning the NCAA men's soccer championship as the Bruins defeated Rutgers in four overtimes as they were they were led by Siggy Schmid as UCLA won one nothing in Quadruple overtime. So good for the tro or good for the Bruins that won their championship. Then UCLA also won the NCAA championship back in 1997. By the way, UCLA went 19 one and two that season. UCLA went 22 and two under Schmid as they beat Virginia in the championship match two nothing. They won in Richmond, which was the host site of the national championship game. UCLA won their first champ, the uh, championship back in 1990 in South Florida. So there was that as well. And by the way, UCLA won in penalty kicks. They won after four rounds of penalty kicks, which uh, which is cool. I hate losing in penalty kick. I hate when a team wins or loses in penalty kicks. That's the ickiest way to win or lose a game. Considering I think it could, because it puts a lot of pressure on the goalie, and then. It's just not fun. But you don't want the game to like go forever. So there's that. Anyway, I also got to make mention of the University of San Diego as they made the NCAA championship in men's soccer back in 2000, or not 2000, back in 1992. The Toreros unfortunately fell to Virginia, which actually marked the first of four straight NCAA men's soccer championships for the Cavaliers as the Toreros lost two to nothing at Davidson. And unfortunately for the Toreros, I still think they're still in search of an NCAA championship or University of San Diego. I hope they do find that championship soon, whether it's in men's or women's soccer, basketball, volleyball, you name it. So now let's jump on over to NCAA softball. So back in 1990, UCLA won the NCAA championship as the Bruins took down Fresno State 2-0. Sharon Backus was the head coach of the Bruins or the skipper of the Bruins as the Bruins won that World Series that or the championship in Oklahoma City and I also got to give a sh- and then UCLA also won that won another championship in 1992 courtesy of Backus as they defeated Arizona 2 nothing in the s- series clinching match as UCLA went 54 and 2 that season. And UCLA was just all over the place in terms of softball. They made through the first 4 years in the 90s, UCLA made the World Series 4 straight times. 91 they lost to Arizona 5-1 in the series in the championship clinching match. Arizona went 56 and 16. And then Arizona beat UCLA in the match in the uh, game in the championship clinching game one nothing as Arizona went fourteen and eight that season. So it really sucks. And then also Arizona Arizona was pretty good in softball back in the nineties as well as Arizona made the championship game I'm looking at this two carry the three minus four. Seven straight years. So we talk about how UCLA was the powerhouse in terms of softball, but Arizona was just as good as Arizona knocked off Cal State Northridge 2-0 in 
back in 1994. Arizona went 64 and 3 that season, and I feel bad for Northridge. It would have been cool to see the Matadors win the World Series, but unfortunately that wasn't the case. And then UCLA won the World Series in softball, the College World Series in softball, back in 1995, defeating Arizona 4-2. to two. Sharon Backus was the he- the head coach that year. So, and I'm, I'm, I'm actually reading this wrong. Arizona made the College World Series in terms of softball eight straight times. Whew, that is crazy. So... So yeah, UCLA, back to UCLA, they beat Arizona 4-2 in the championship-clinching match where the Bruins went 50-6 back in 1995. And then UCLA won the College World Series back in 1999 as they had a new head coach in Sue Enquist. The Bruins knocked off Washington in, in the championship-clinching match 3-2, and UCLA went 63-6 and that year. And I also got to make note that UCLA lost in the championship match against Arizona as Arizona was led by Ma- Mike Candrea as the Wildcats beat the Bruins 10-2. to And that was pretty much that for UCLA. As we say hello to Andrew Hagenbaugh. Thank you for tuning in, Andrew. Just talking about UCLA and how... or No, I was talking about all the Southern California teams that won championships and in men's soccer, believe it or not, UCLA men's soccer won two championships back in the 1990s. And then San Diego made the made the championship match back in 92. So good for San Diego, but they didn't win it. Speaking of soccer action, definitely do check out the Soccer Scoreboard Show every Sunday at 2.30 p.m. Pacific Time, 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time with Andrew Hagenbaugh. Andrew does a great job with his show. And later today, in less than one hour, Andrew will be going live with the state of Ohio sports. And he'll be talking about how Ohio sports will has uh, done back in the 90s, for better and for worse. And the same can be said for Southern California. They didn't have too many pro teams win, the, win a championship, but they had a lot of college teams that won the, uh, won the NCAA championship. So... There's that right there. Now let's jump to NCAA Women's Volleyball. I kind of already went over this on on a Tuesday when I did set point, but I only I went through all of the teams. As UCLA was one of the dominant teams that decade, UCLA won the championships the NCAA Women's Volleyball Championships back in 1990, 1990 and 1991 under Andy Benikowski. In 1990, UCLA defeated Pacific 3 to nothing, 3-0. They swept them. And then UCLA defeated Long Beach State in five sets at UCLA. And then UCLA fell in the NCAA Women's Volleyball Championship to Stanford, three sets to one. Stanford was what, probably the perennial team of the NCAA women's volleyball decade in terms of the NCAA women's volleyball in terms of the 1990s. But in 1993, Long Beach State managed to defeat Penn State three sets to one in the 1993 Women's Volleyball NCAA Championships. The 49ers, or then 49ers, were led by Brian Gimilaro, who is a very respectable guy, and I see him on volleyball broadcasts every time Long Beach State plays on ESPN3 or ESPNU, which is cool. And then in 1994, UCLA made the NCAA Women's Volleyball Championship but lost to Stanford, three sets to one. And then it was a while since a Southern California team made the NCAA Women's Volleyball Championship. But fast forward all the way to 1998, where Long Beach State made the championship match and defeated Penn State three sets to two as Brian Gimilaro was the head coach. And the significant thing about Long Beach State that year, back in 1998, was that they were the only team in that decade to go undefeated. I talked about how it's tough to go undefeated and win a championship on any level in any sport, but Long Beach State was able to do it back in 1998. But Long Beach State was led by Misty May Trainer, who was probably the premier women's volleyball player back in the 90s. So there's that right there. 
And that was pretty much all the Southern California teams that won an NCAA Women's Volleyball Championship. Now let's jump to the men's side of things. Now, I already mentioned this back on set point that long that uh, UCLA was the dominant powerhouse, but they didn't start out as the po- dominant powerhouse. As in 1990, USC, under the head coach of Jim McLaughlin, defeated Long Beach State in the championship match, winning three sets to one. The Trojans were 26 in seven that season, but in 1991, Long Beach State got revenge as the 49ers, or then 49ers, defeated the Trojans three sets to one. The 49ers were led by Ray Rattel. And then in 1992, Pepperdine defeated Stanford in the championship match, winning in straight sets, as Pepperdine was led by Marv Dunphy. And then in, from 1993 all the way to 1998, UCLA was the dominant team in terms of NCAA men's volleyball. As in 1993, UCLA won the NCAA men's volleyball championship, sweeping Cal State Northridge. Al Skates was the head coach, and UCLA was the host school. In 1994, UCLA made it to the NCAA championship match, but lost to Penn State as the Bruins lost in five sets. Tom Peterson was the head coach of the Nittany Lions. But in 1995 and 1996, Al Skates led the Bruins to an NC- back-to-back NCAA championships. UCLA went 31-1 and back in 95, and in 1996, UCLA went 26-5. and UCLA defeated Penn State 3-0 in the championship match, and then they defeated Penn- they defeated Hawaii three sets to two in 1996. In 1997, UCLA made the championship match but lost to Stanford as Runin Neves, the head coach of Stanford, defeated the Bruins three sets to two, and that was that for them. And then in 1998, UCLA returned to power as they defeated Pepperdine in straight sets as Al Skates won his fourth NCAA men's volleyball championship with the Bruins. And then 1999, Long Beach State made the NCAA championship game, but unfortunately fell to BYU, which went 30-1 and in straight sets. The game actually took place at UCLA, so I think everyone was thinking, oh, UCLA is just going to make the championship again. But UCLA did not, so there's that right there. So that's that for NCAA men's volleyball. Now let's jump to NCAA men's basketball. So, back in 1995, this was the only Southern California team that either made or won the NCAA Men's Basketball Championship. UCLA, under the head coach, watch under the watchful eye of Jim Herrick, was able to defeat Arkansas 89-78 as the Bruins won the NCAA Men's Championship. And the Bruins continue to be the true blue blood of NCAA basketball and they're not as big of a blue blood as Duke or North Carolina, but they're kind of up there. They're at least the blue blood of the of the West Coast in terms of like California and whatnot. But that was the only Southern California team that either won or made the championship match in NCAA men's basketball. Now, for men's water polo, oh gee, many Christmas NCAA men's water polo. There were a lot of Southern California teams that won the. The uh, that won or made the championship match in men's water polo. Why? Because California is such a hub for like for like uh, talented teams uh, to like dominate in in terms of NCAA men's water polo. Southern California is no exception. In 1991, UCLA made it all the way to the championship match, but unfortunately lost to Cal, losing seven to six. But and then in 1993, USC lost to Stanford 11 to nine in the championship match. And then Stan- USC was lost to Stanford again in the championship match back in 1994, losing 14 to 10. So I talked about how California was dominant in terms of in terms of uh, winning in making the NCAA Men's Water Polo Championship, but not Southern California. NorCal was the one that dominated. But then 1995 changed that tune as UCLA won the 
won it back-to-back championships in 1995 and 1996 as Guy Baker guided UCLA to two national championships in men's water polo. The Bruins defeated Cal 10-8 to in the championship match, while UCLA defeated USC 8-7. to I'm sorry to all the USC fans that had to hear that, but it is what it is. Anyway, so that was quite the impressive feat for Guy Baker and UCLA. In 1997, Pepperdine, led by Terry Schroeder, won in double overtime over Southern Cal. Oh, oh, yeah, over USC. I unfortunately, the score got unfortunately cut off, which was my bad. But Pepperdine won the NCAA Men's Water Polo Championship that year. And then in 1998, USC finally broke through as one of the true blue bloods in terms of men's water polo as they defeated Stanford in double overtime, winning 9-8. to John Williams and, I'm probably going to butcher his name, Yo Hovon Vavich, Vavich was, were the coaches for the Trojans. And then UCLA returned to its power under Guy Baker and Adam Crick Corian as they want as they beat Stanford six to five in the championship match. So UCLA has quite a bit number of championship quite a number of championships in terms of men's water polo. It's quite astounding. And so and for those that are wondering where NCAA women's water polo is, there was no NCAA women's water polo back in the nineties. Which was disappointing and whatnot. I was very sad face, but it is what it is. And that pretty much covers that in terms of the NCAA champions back in the 90s regarding the NCAA men's and women's teams from Southern California. I know it seemed like a lot, but but I guess Southern California does does have success, mainly courtesy of UCLA, because there's a reason why UCLA has won, is like one of the top, schools in terms of winning national championships with Stanford and whatnot. I think US, USC is like third or something like that, but we're not talking about USC. We're talking about UCLA. So that's that for my 90s theme. Definitely continue to check out iSports Radio's 90s theme shows this week as 90s theme is going to come to a close. I believe it's going to come to a close on Sunday. I'm not sure. Either way, Let's jump to some MLB action. So the Angels, Dodgers, and Padres are actually doing good, which is quite impressive. I didn't think that I'd be saying that because I thought one or two teams would be doing good. But but the Angels have joined the fray. So the Angels have been quite the pleasant surprise this year. In their opening season against the White Sox, they took three out of four. Last Thursday, the Angels beat the White Sox three to f- or four to three, as they were able to withstand the White Sox as they were able to drive in two runs in the bottom of the eighth inning. That seems that that's kind of a theme for the Angels. They always seem to drive home runs that whenever they truly need it in the eighth inning or the latter part of the game, which is not really a recipe for success. In the second game. The White Sox defeated the Angels 12-8. to The Angels... And the the Angels only trailed 7-6 to as the White Sox actually led 7-1 to at one point until the Angels started to chip it away. And then the White Sox got hot as they blasted five home... They drove in five runs. The, and in typical Angels fashion... Their bullpen, their bullpen imploded, and then the Angels only were able to drive in two runs in the ninth inning, which is a big fat no-no. And then on, and then on Sunday, the Angels were able to were able to bounce back and drive in three runs in the bottom of the eighth to win five to three over the White Sox. Which was quite impressive. Again, it seems like the Angels were able to are able to like drive in runs when it, it late in later stages of the game. Which, again, I don't really think that's a recipe for success. But it is what it is. And that was actually on Saturday. My bad. So Thursday they won. Friday they lost. Saturday they won. And then Sunday, 
the Angels were able to defeat the White Sox off of a walk-off home run from from Jared Walsh. It was a three-run home run as it was a walk-off home run, and the Angels won that one 7-4. to four. It was a great to see them win on on uh, Sunday Night Baseball or, or uh, ba- whatever the ESPN calls their little baseball uh, segment on Sunday. Either way, the thing that that almost cost the Angels was their pitching in the ninth inning. I knew the Angels were only up one, and I'm thinking, okay, this is the danger zone for the Angels. They're only up they're only up one run, and they still they still have yet to get run support. And then it looked as if the Angels were going to wind up losing, but then Jared Walsh saved the day because the White Sox were foolish to walk Mike Trout. But I see why. Like Mike Trout, it, you you never want to face Mike Trout in the bottom of the ninth inning because that's when his dad powers could kick in. So this past Monday, the Angels were able to edge the Houston Astros, winning seven to six. It looked as if the Angels were going to implode in the ninth inning, but they got out of the jam as as Mike Myers was or Mike Mayers or Myers was able to get the save. And the Angels drove in four runs. That's what really surprised me. I thought, okay, Angels are going to lose to the Astros. It's over. And this seems to always happen when I ever see an Astros-Angels game. I'm like, okay, Angels lost. And then the Angels somehow come back and make me eat my words. And it's like, okay, cool. (laughs) But unfortunately for the Angels, they lost the second game against the Houston Astros, losing 4-2. It was 2-2 throughout most of the game. Like, the Angels drove in two runs. The Astros drove in two runs in the second inning. And then in the ninth inning, it was still 2-2. The the Astros got a two-run home run courtesy of Carlos Correa. And that was what doomed the Angels. But again, this is what happens when the Angels go into the ninth inning with no insurance runs. Like, you can't be tied 2-2 against the Astros. That is a recipe for disaster. So there's that. And then yesterday, the Angels defeated the Toronto Blue Jays 7-5 to in Florida, which is where the Blue Jays are playing their games. I was surprised that the Angels were able to outlast the Blue Jays in extra innings. So it's good for them. Because the Angels still have to deal with that stupid extra innings rule where a runner on second is there. Which, I get it speeds the game up, but it just makes it... But it just means that you're both... Both teams have to bank on their bullpen. And if your bullpen isn't good, then you're going to have an uphill climb. But I guess that means your pitching staff has to be good, and you you can't suck. So, Angels are 5-2 and two to start the season. I do remember on bases loaded that if they if uh, the Angels went at least 5-5 five and five in their first two games, they'd still be okay. By the way, definitely do check out bases loaded every Sunday at 7... Or I think it's 5 p.m. Pacific time, 8 p.m. Eastern time on StreamYard slash YouTube. So, yeah, definitely do check out Bases Loaded with Brandon Buckingham, Blake Henley, and Chris Garcia. But so far the Angels are 5-2, and two and they're looking pretty good. They do have three more games against the Blue Jays, in which the Blue Jays are a legit contender to possibly win the AL East. But they still have to go through the Yankees. I can at least see the Blue Jays making the postseason as a wild card team. But looking ahead to the, the Angels' schedule next week, we have the Angels taking on the Kansas City Royals at Kansas City on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And then they'll have a day off next Thursday. But next Friday, they are back home at Angel Stadium against the Twins in a three-game series next Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then the Angels will get somewhat of a breather of a breather the following week as they'll face the Texas Rangers. But the Angels, no, nothing is guaranteed when it comes to the Angels, especially when it comes to that shoddy bullpen of theirs. Like, they can't just get all comfortable and lazy after winning a series, after splitting a series against the Astros and winning a series against the... White Sox. And I know Dusty Baker is one of the more overrated managers in MLB, but you got to give him some credit, though. Also, I got to make note that a Dodgers fan, yes, a Dodgers fan, contrary to popular belief, a Dodgers fan threw a 
a blown up trash can onto the field. Like it was a balloon trash can. Well, not like a balloon balloon, but it was a inflated trash can that he just threw onto the uh threw onto the uh onto the field. And I'm just going to say this to all you Astros fans out there. It was not an Angels fan. It was a Dodgers fan, okay? I have the proof that the Dodgers fan threw it onto the field. And I will post it and to like have everyone shut their mouths and saying that an Angels fan threw it out there. It was a Dodgers fan. I think an Angels fan did throw a trash can, an actual trash can, onto the field, but I don't know who threw it. Like, it could have been another Dodgers fan. It could have been a Dodgers fan disguised as an Angels fan. Either way, Angels fans don't really have too much beef with the Astros outside of the Astros being the rivals of the Angels. But I think the true, I think it was mainly Dodgers fans because I did get hear about the plan of Dodgers fans purchasing tickets to to Angels games when the Astros play the Angels, and then them just finding ways to like make the Astros' day a living nightmare and whatnot. So I know this, and this would have happened had it not been for COVID. But unfortunately, that was not the case, and there's that. So that's enough talk for about the Angels. The Angels are doing well, and I hope they continue this great string of string of luck. Now let's go to the Dodgers. So today, the Dodgers get their championship rings, and boy, do they look good. What isn't looking good is the Dodgers against the Nationals. They're tied zero to zero, but the Nationals have a man on third and second, or I'm sorry, a man on third and first with two outs. But looking back at the Do- the uh, Dodgers' series, they took three out of four against the Rockies. The Dodgers lost the first game 8-5, to five, which was disappointing. But then the Dodgers won the next three games. They defeated the Rockies 11-6 to six on last Friday. They defeated the Rockies 6-5 to five last Saturday. And then they defeated the Rockies 4-2 to two last Sunday. So, good stuff. And then this past week, the Dodgers took two out of three against the Oakland Athletics. They beat the A's 10-3 this past Monday. They beat the A's 5-1 to this past Tuesday. And in 10 innings, in disappointing fashion, the Dodgers lost to the Athletics 4-3, to courtesy of a Kenley Jansen blown save. <sighs> really, Kenley? Like, really, my man? And the thing about the Athletics was is that they had no wins going into that game, and Kenley Jansen decides to blow it. Gosh, dang it. And starting today, the Dodgers have a three-game series against the Nationals. The Nationals did not score, as it is now the middle of the fifth inning. The Dodgers are now up, and the Dodgers and Nationals are still tied 0-0. So, after their series against the Nationals, the Dodgers have a three-game series against the Rockies on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And then on... And then next Friday, Saturday, and Sunday... The Dodgers have a three-game series against the Padres in San Diego, which that's going to be a fun, fun series. And honestly, I think I've heard we're on the street is that tickets to that series have already been sold out. So there's that right there. So to any Dodgers or Padres fans that was hoping to get tickets, if you don't have them, I feel bad for you. Just saying. Now let's close the door on the Padres. So... The thing about the Padres is that I heard Fernando Tatis did get hurt in with a uh, as he as a Tatis Jr. with a dislocated shoulder as he actually took a hard swing for a strike three and then he winced in pain and then. And uh, ugh, from what I'm hearing, according to according to manage to the uh, San Diego Padres' manager Jace Tingler, that the shoulder popped out and it was pop put back in place in the training room. So I guess he's okay, but that's gotta hurt. But it is concerning, according to Tingler. 
And he says he doesn't want to see Tatis playing through pain and whatnot. So at least they were able to pop the shoulder back in, but it still is a little concerning. Like, looking at the game against the... The uh, the second game between the Giants and the Padres looks like Tatis did not play. Yeah, Tatis didn't play in the second game against the the San Francisco Giants, and then the third game against the Giants, we did not see Tatis in that game. So I imagine this injury is going to be. I don't think it's going to be long term, but he's is going to be out for a while. And in that series, the Padres lost two out of three against the Giants. The Giants, this past Monday, took game one, where Tatis got hurt, three to two. And then in game two, this past Tuesday, the Padres beat the Giants three to one. And then in this past Wednesday, in ten innings, the Giants defeated the Padres three to two. And that's how the Giants were able to take two of three of against the Padres. In the opening series but for the Padres, the Padres were able to take 3 of 4 against the Diamondbacks. The Padres won, won game 1 last Thursday, 8-7. to seven. Then last Friday, the Padres beat the Diamondbacks 4-2. to two. This past Saturday, the Padres beat the Diamondbacks 7 to nothing. And then this past Sunday, the Diamondbacks got the better of the Padres, winning 3-1. to one. So looking ahead to the Padres' schedule... They have they start a three game road trip or three game road series against the Padres on starting today and then ending on Sunday in the morning. Gosh. But then again that's afternoon for if you're the Texas Rangers. So there's that. And then on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, the Padres have a four game road trip against the Pittsburgh Pirates, which after they won their season opening game against the Cubbies, the Pirates have now lost six straight, which is typical Pittsburgh Pirates. And then next Friday, and then like I said, next Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the Padres play the Dodgers at Petco Park. And I again, I think it's going to be a fun series. But if you're the Padres, you got to be concerned with Tatis. You got to let him heal on his own, and you just got to get through it without him. Like. Uh, and also, the Padres don't need not to look ahead. Because if they look ahead, it's going to be all bad news. And I didn't talk about the Dodgers. Oh, no. Yes, I did. I did talk about the Dodgers' up-and-coming schedule. They have the Nationals this weekend. They have the Rockies next week. And then they also have the Padres, which I pretty much talked about, at Petco Park. So, either way, it's a fun time for our current MLB teams in Southern California and hopefully just hopefully the Angels can hold on like I'm not concerned about the Dodgers and the Padres well maybe the Padres with Tatis but I I can see the Dodgers making the postseason I can see the Padres making the postseason it's the Angels I'm concerned about they were chosen to finish second in the AL West and make the, the playoffs as a wild card team I just hope they can do that because I don't think us Angels fans want to see another season of Mike Trout missing the postseason. It just would not be fun. Because Mike Trout signed that mega deal and he ha- he hasn't won a playoff game. He's made the postseason, but but making the postseason and actually winning a playoff game are two totally different things. So there's that right there. And that's going to do it for the MLB portion of the show. And that's going to actually do it for today's episode of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. Thank you all for tuning in on this beautiful Friday afternoon. I definitely appreciate it. Shout out to Andrew Hagenbaugh, who is in the chat room. I definitely appreciate you popping in, my brother. It always makes my day when you pop in and say what's up. Definitely check out Andrew Hagenbaugh's show, The State of Ohio Sports, in about... 25 minutes from now and then also check out the soccer scoreboard show every saturday or every sunday with andrew hagenbaugh at 2 30 p.m pacific time 5 30 p.m eastern time i also gotta give a shout to our two sponsors legacy financial and socal warriors definitely appreciate that 
And the SoCal Supreme Sports Show is very proud to have the SoCal Warriors as an official sponsor of IE Sports Radio. Your direct feed for all of that is sports. And you can follow IE Sports Radio on Twitter and on Instagram at IE Sports Radio. Definitely give them a follow and a like on Facebook. Give them a subscribe on Apple Podcasts and on YouTube. And give them a a positive rating and a five-star rating on on uh, Apple Podcasts and give them a good good review on Facebook and whatnot. So there's that, right? So there's that, and definitely do your part to try to help IE Sports Radio continue to grow because without you, we don't amount to too much. But that's going to do it for this show. Without any further delay, it is time I get on out of here because I got to get me something to eat before I head off to work. You know what I mean, Jelly Bean? Once again, thank you all for tuning in to the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. It really means a lot. If you're listening live, I definitely appreciate it. If you're listening on the playback, I also appreciate it. Definitely do check out the State of Ohio Sports. That's going to be coming on in less than 25 minutes. Andrew Hagenbaugh does an amazing job with his shows. And yes, I said shows because he also does a great job with the Soccer Scoreboard Show. I will be seeing you all next Monday when I do Set Point. I will be on at 11 a.m. Pacific Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, and I will have a special guest. You probably already heard about it on Set Point, but I'm not going to repeat it again. Ha <laughs> ha! For everyone here at IE Sports Radio, this is Taryn Rodriguez signing off. Have yourselves a great rest of the weekend. Enjoy the sports, enjoy life, be safe. Do your thing to slow the spread. And remember, SoCal is for SoCal. Peace.